Now the message today is going to be dealing with the subject of opening our homes to Christ. And uh, some of you probably have heard the um, very famous Motel 6 commercial. How many of you know what the tagline is in that commercial? We'll leave the light on for you. It became one of the most uh, famous uh, advertising campaigns. What most people don't know is the announcer in the initial commercial, Tom Baudet, um, the very expensive marketing company had come up with a script for him to do this radio commercial. The phrase, we'll leave the light on for you, was nowhere in the script. As he was recording the announcement for Motel 6, he saw the clock still had like three seconds left on it and he thought, well, that's going to be dead time. I ought to say something. And so ad lib, he said, we'll leave the light on for you. And no one even remembers what the marketing agency wrote. What they kept was what Baudet wrote himself because it just sort of embraced the whole idea. You know, if you've ever been traveling across dark country and you see the porch light sort of represents home and that someone's waiting up for you and there's a light on in the window and all of that was sort of encompassed in that one brief phrase, a door that's open. Now, I know our bodies are like temples. Uh, they're homes. The question is, is it a home where Christ is a resident? Is he a guest? Does the Lord live in our lives? And this is where we get the word hospitality, hospitality. It's someone who opens up their lives and invites people in. But the most important guest that we can invite into our lives is, of course, the Lord. Now I'm going to start with what is a familiar verse and then we're going to jump to some verses that may not be as familiar. Luke chapter 2 verse 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be registered with Mary his betrothed wife who was with child. Now both day of Joseph and a Mary were from the lineage of David. You can trace, Luke traces the genealogy of Jesus back through the mother. It's through the, um, the matriarchal, or the, the, actually through Mary's mother, which is Joseph's father-in-law. And Matthew traces it back through Joseph. That's why you'll see a small discrepancy between those two genealogies. They were both of the household of David. But the Caesar had wanted everyone to come to their hometown so they could be registered. There was a census that was being taken. And the reason he's doing this is for taxes. And it says that when they came to the town of Bethlehem, the days were delivered for, the days were accomplished or completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. Swaddling cloth is just strips of cloth and laid him in a trough, a manger where f animals were fed. And someone who reads this is going, why are they putting him in a, an animal trough? And then Luke goes on and says, well, um, there was no room for him in the inn. Uh, first of all, Joseph and Mary, they maybe had family, but everybody had come. And so the family space was run out. And then the other natural place you'd go is to the the local mom and pop bed and breakfast, they were the hotels or the inn, and there's no room there, and you just think it's amazing that when Christ came into this world, there's no room for him. You can read in John 1, verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. His own people didn't know him. Now, wouldn't it be sad if you had an opportunity to invite the Lord into your home or into your heart and you missed it because you didn't know who he was. That's citing from that old spiritual, we didn't know who you was. He came to his own and his own didn't know him. No room in the end. Now the Lord not only wants to know us, he wants to be in our lives, he wants to have a personal relationship with us. What is the Lord gonna declare to those that are lost? I never knew you, depart from me. And the Bible goes on to say, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge in the book of Hosea. What is that knowledge that is devastating? 
to not know the Lord, to not have a personal relationship with God. Have you invited the Lord into your home and into your heart? Is he part of your life every day? You know, what did Jesus say to Zacchaeus? He said, come down for today. I must abide at your house. I want to be with you. I want to abide with you. Now, instead of spending our time talking about a failure, I want to spend some time talking about a success. You can read, if you turn in your Bible, we're going to spend most of our time now in the second book of Kings, second Kings chapter four, and there's a story and the story is of the Shunammite woman. 2 Kings chapter 4, and we're going to be going from verse 8 and reading about 30 verses. Now this is about the story of Elisha, and it tells us about not someone who did not receive the Lord, but someone who did receive the Lord into their home. And if you look in 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 8, it says, now it happened on one day that Elisha went to Shunam, where there was a notable woman and she persuaded him to eat some food. And so it was, as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small room on the wall and let us put a bed there and a table and a chair and a lampstand so it will be that whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. Now see, Elisha, well I should actually back up a little bit, during the time of Samuel the prophet, he established the schools of the prophets. And the schools of the prophets were set up in about six locations around the northern territory. During the time of Samuel, there was a lot of apostasy in the kingdom, and so he established this school that would be training men in ministry. They weren't all related, it didn't call them the sons of the prophets because they were all genetically related. It was sort of a title for those who would be studying the ways of the Lord who could also help teach the people. And um, during the time of Elisha, there was a revival of that. You remember during the days of Elijah, the sons of the prophets, they had to hide in caves because Jezebel was trying to kill them all. And Elisha spent some time, they were building a school down by Jericho, that's when the ax head fell on water. He spent his time working with them. They, they wanted to build one there um, by Jericho and the spring was bad and so he put some salt in the spring to try to heal the waters. And so he spent quite a bit of time raising up these places where there were the disciples. And so Elisha went in a circuit on a regular basis teaching, encouraging the people, trying to fortify the revival that really started during the time of Elijah. So this woman who's a Shunammite, the Shunammites were not Israelites. They were from another tribe. They were, they were actually leftovers from the Canaanite people. And she sees that he's a man of God. You know, Elijah did a lot of miracles. And they knew that he had the power of God. I mean, he hits the water and it parts. He heals the waters. Axe head floats. Oil multiplies for this lady. Elisha ends up doing twice the miracles of Elijah. Gets a double portion of his spirit. And she says to her husband, you know, he stops by and I know he's a man of God and we want to do something for him so we feed him. And, and I can tell that there's just this, he's, he knows the Lord, there's an attraction, there's a connection with God that he has. And she said, it's not enough that we feed him. She said, look, the Lord's blessed us. Says that she's a notable woman, that means they're wealthy. She let's make a place for him so that he can be a guest here whenever he comes by, he is going to see this as a home away from home sort of something like what Mary and Martha did for Jesus. Whenever Jesus was around Jerusalem, he would end up staying, if not in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went to Bethany and he stayed with Martha and Lazarus and their younger sister Mary. So they said, we want to make a place for him here. We want to make him comfortable. Now the Shunammites, they were not Israelites. They spoke a different language. You'll notice through the story that Elisha does not speak to her directly because they don't speak the same language. He keeps speaking to her through Gehazi, his servant, who evidently spoke some of the language of Shunam. Now, does anyone know who are some other Shunamites in the Bible? Can you name some? Abishag, Abishag this pretty young virgin that was found when David was old, he had congestive heart failure and he was shaken all the time. And they put blankets and he couldn't get warm. So they searched the land, they found some beautiful young virgins that had good, good circulation 
And they had one of them become a wife of David and she would basically snuggle him to keep him warm because they didn't have electric blankets back then. So he had to get a living blanket. And they said one of the most beautiful girls was Abishag. Now there's some, there's a rumor. You ever read the Song of Solomon? There's this um, love story to the Shunammite. And many wondered, David never knew Abishag. They wondered if this Shunammite that, did, that Solomon fell in love with was Abishag. And she would have been younger than him. By the way, Solomon's brother, Adonijah, wanted to marry her after his father died. So it wasn't unthought of, but there's another Shunammite. So they were a people that were living at peace. Many of them worshiped the God of Israel, but they were really holdovers or holdovers from the Canaanites. So it's interesting that this man of God who's bringing revival to the northern tribes, he is on a constant circuit among his people, but who is it that ends up inviting him to stay? Not one of his own people, but one of the Canaanites. Does... Um, Elijah during the time of famine, who does he stay with? Does he stay with an Israelite? Or does he stay with a woman of Tyre up in the north? Isn't that interesting? And the Messiah ends up coming through Ruth the Moabitess and Tamar and Rahab. And here you have another Canaanite woman showing kindness to the man of God. She said, let's make a room. She tells her husband. You read on, you'll find out he's a little older than her. But she respects him. You, through the story, she does these things in concert with her husband. Let's make a small upper room on the wall. Now, any of you ever read this story in the children's storybooks, my Bible friends? It's in there, and it makes it sound like they put the room for Elijah right on top of their house. It's actually talking about the wall of their compound, just like Rahab's house was in the wall. And so these people are wealthy. They've got a wall around their compound and some are near the wall where he could have his own private space. They built up, they made a room, built it up off the ground. They sometimes had the animals would stay underneath and uh, had a desk in it, a bed, a table. Maybe had a cot also for his servant Gehazi who's always with him. A table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us that he can turn in there. She is doing everything she can to make staying with her family attractive to the man of God. Now why does she want to do that? Well, you know, it's a good idea to have holy people stay with you. <laughs> um, she's creating these uh, creature comforts because uh, she wants him to stay with her. She wants the blessing of God in her house. Do you do everything you can to invite the Lord into your home? And it says, you know, in the first part of the verse, it says she constrained him. She urged him. It kind of makes it sound like when those two disciples were walking down the road to Emmaus and Jesus was talking to him, they said, this man knows the word of God. This man knows the Lord. And when they came to a fork in the road and they're about to turn into the town of Emmaus, they said, Please abide with us. They urged him. They constrained him. They pled with him. Were they glad they did? Turned out that it was uh, Jesus himself. They didn't know. Some have entertained angels unaware. And then you can read in the Bible the story about um, Lot. When the messengers came from the Lord to Sodom and Gomorrah, the angel said, we'll stay out in the street. But Lot said, no, no. You come into my house. He urged them. And did Lot know he was bringing messengers from God into his house? Ended up saving him and his family. And so um, they're urging this on them. And she does everything she can to make them comfortable. Puts all these creature comforts in the home. Now is there a blessing promised on those who are caring about the needs of others? Did Jesus promise special blessings on those who would care for his messengers? You can read in Mark 9, 41, when he sent out the disciples, he said, for whoever will give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. And the other thing that's happening is she realizes God is with Elisha, and so she is seeking godly friends. Proverbs 13, 20, he that walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. Psalm 119, verse 63. 
I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. 2 Corinthians 6.14 Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion has light with darkness? And so she goes to all this care and one day Elisha is going through the circuit of the land and all of a sudden he comes back and he says something's different about the Shunammite's house. He's talking to Gehazi. He says what in the world? She's got this construction project going on and they see him coming and they run out to the gate and they meet him and uh, she says we're so glad you're here. Look we want to show you something. They bring him up the stairs. They said see this room? See the window? Got a flower on the table there. Got a lamp on the table. Okay so you want to read some scrolls. Um, get a bed, a few pieces of fruit in a bowl on the table. See this? This is your place. Whenever you come by here, this is your place. You know, it's kind of nice. Um, when I was first pastoring in Covalo, I did several meetings in the Ukiah Church. Have any of you been to the church in Ukiah, California? Across the street from the church, they got a caretaker's home. And in the caretaker's home, they have a guest home for whenever they have a guest speaker. And it was so nice because on several occasions I got to stay at that house. And I knew the family there and whenever I needed a place to stay, they said, this is your place. And because it was about 70 miles from Kovalo, it was kind of nice to have a, just a little room for the prophet that was there. I'm just saying that tongue in cheek, of course. So um, they said they want you to be um, comfortable here. Mikasa Sukasa. Now they had to say that through Gehazi. And so he's just overwhelmed by their kindness. And he says to Gehazi, he says, look, they, they're caring for us with all this care. This, just, this is too much. They've gone the second mile. That is so kind. It's not just that they feed us. They were feeding them whenever they traveled by. Now they're not only giving us food, they've made a room for us, our own place. Now, Elisha was a prophet that, you know, he knew hardship. He traveled around with Elijah and Elijah sometimes, you know, he stayed out with the birds and caves and, and uh, mountaintops and doesn't say that he had anything real fancy. So it, it's nice to get an upgrade like that. And this is not even coming from his own people. So he calls Gehazi and he says, what can be done? You know, if you look in your Bible here, I'm in chapter 4 and um, it says, when he came, verse 11, on one day he turned into the upper room and he lay down there in the morning. He says to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite woman because he, he knew that she was behind it. She was the host. And when he had called her, she stood before him and he said to him, Ge uh, Elisha says to Gehazi because he's speaking through him, say now to her, look, you've been concerned for us with all of this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king? or the commander of the army, the general? Now you realize that Elisha had a lot of clout with the kingdom. When Elisha got old and he was dying, the king came to see him. He had a personal relationship. Uh, one time Elisha managed to single-handedly capture an entire army. Have you read that story? The general thought, I, I can't do what Elisha does. Elisha says a prayer. The whole enemy army struck blind and he leads the whole enemy army into the city of Samaria. And so Elisha had the ear of the king. He had the ear of the general. And he said, are you being bothered by any of your neighbors? Or maybe there's some boundary dispute? Or, or you know, it, sometimes because you're a Canaanite and not an Israelite, they don't treat you right. Is there somebody I can, what can I do for you? I'm not rich, and, but maybe I can talk to someone. I do have some connections. And he's saying, what can I do for you? You know what he's saying? You have invited me into your home. I want to answer your prayer. Pray. Ask me something. Now when you invite Christ into your life and you say, Lord, you are, we want you to not just visit. We want you to dwell in our hearts, in our home. The Lord, will he do less for you? Or doesn't God say, ask. Up till now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask that your joy might be full. And so he's saying through Gehazi, what does she want? By the way, the Lord sometimes says to us through others. He speaks to us through others. What do you want? What can I do for you? And so she says, you know, I live among my own people. 
Um, we've, we've got a big yard and our relatives live around us and she says, hey, we're okay. We have no disputes with any of our neighbors. Thank you, that's very nice. She's very graceful, she doesn't wanna, she says, I didn't give you this because I wanted something. I gave you this because you're a man of God and it just makes us feel good having you around. We know that you walk with God and we love God and we just want to bless you and you do a lot of things and you sacrifice for God and so we're wanting to take care of you. And then Gehazi, he reads between the lines and you go to verse 14, Elisha says, what is to be done for her? We've got to do something for her. And Gehazi says, actually, she has no son and her husband's old. Elisha, haven't you noticed that uh, they're getting to be an older couple? There's no children. Now, the way this is written, it says no son, and that word in the original Hebrew means no male offspring. But it may mean that they had just no boy which was very important in that culture because the, the family, they often had big families and usually plenty of boys. Some of you remember in the story of the Exodus, there was a national crisis when this one man had five daughters and no sons. They weren't sure what to do. How do we pass on the inheritance? You remember that story? So uh, it may mean that, but it sounds like from the context they ha she had no children and there would be no heir. And he says, call her. And so she calls, she comes and stands in the door. Now she's standing in the doorway. Promises are often made there. She doesn't want to intrude. And he declares to her, about this time next year, you will embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. Now what is she saying? She doesn't believe it? Or she's saying that'd be too good to be true? Or don't tease me like that. This had been the longing of her heart that they might have children. She never even dreamed that this would happen. But he makes a promise to her and you know what else he's making? He's making a prophecy. And she said, don't lie to your maidservant. What does Mary call herself when the angel says, you're gonna have a promised son? She said, be it unto you, be it unto your maidservant. So here's a prophecy of a special son that's gonna come and you'll find out later this boy ends up being a type of Christ. Don't lie to me. And the woman conceived, verse 17, does God keep his promise? Now I expect that she and her husband cooperated but it says the woman conceived, I mean even after God told a Abraham you're gonna end up having a, a son not with Hagar, you're gonna have one with Sarah. God worked a miracle but Abraham and Sarah cooperated with that miracle. The woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come of which Elijah had, Elisha had told her. So this is one year later, she has a boy. Now she is so thrilled. Um, she wanted to be a blessing. By the way, if any of you are thinking about children, it doesn't mean you invite the pastor over for dinner and that everything's gonna be taken care of. <laughs> that could be misunderstood more ways than one. But I'm just saying that this was a type of Christ and this is a type of Jesus in this promise here. And the child grew. Everything was well. She's happy. Years went by. Elisha continues to go on his circuit. He's teaching. All is well until one day. You know, just because God blesses you and you invite the Lord into your life doesn't mean you're never going to have challenges or temptations or trials. And it says that... Um, the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father to the reapers. He's on his own. He's running around. He's, he's been weaned. He's big enough where his father's out in the field and he says, Mama, can I go out and be with Daddy and the reapers? And she said, Go ahead. He runs out to the field and he's maybe playing or helping a little bit. And he said to his father, My head, my head. He grabs his head and he drops his sheaf he's carrying around and and uh, we don't know exactly what it was. It gets very hot in that part of the country during the harvest time. Could have been sunstroke. Could have been some rapid onset of some sort of meningitis. It could have been an aneurysm. I mean, we could speculate all day long what was doing it, but he was overcome with a sudden pain in his head. Father not knowing what to do, he might have thought, well, I don't know, he got stung by a hornet. Who knows what happened? And you know what fathers do when the kids are hurt? They say, go see mom. And uh, now if he had broken a toy, dad would say, I'd see if I can fix it. But when he's sick, he said, you go see your mother. 
And so a servant brings him, helps him to the mother, and um, when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees. She's rocking him, trying to figure out what's wrong, maybe fanning his face and mopping his fever with a wet cloth or something, and he sits on her knees till noon, and then he dies. She watches her son die. Does Mary see Jesus die? She has his promised son. And you know what? The, when, when Mary brought Jesus to the temple, you know what Simon said to Mary? He said, a sword is going to pierce your own soul. Yes, you'll have joy, and there'll be gladness. And even the angels declared, peace on earth, joy to the world. But Mary not only had the joy, it later turned to sadness because that boy died and here she's holding him in her arms and she hears him breathe his last and that had to be heartbreaking and he died now it doesn't say he was asleep it's very clear I want you to notice he died is the word verse 20 that's used and she went up and she laid him on the bed of the man of God and she shut the door upon him and she went out she doesn't put him on their bed she doesn't put him on his own bed she brings him up and puts him on the bed of the man of God. Why does she do that? She's sort of claiming a promise. She's saying, look, this has been a child of promise. You promised me this son. You did it when I was in your room in your doorway. I'm going back where I first heard that promise and I'm going to remind God of what he's done. She put him on Elisha's bed. She still, did she start to doubt that Elisha was a man of God? No, she just doesn't understand why this has happened. So she's got to go and get a hold of the source of the miracle and she's going to need another miracle. She puts him on Elisha's bed. She shuts the door and she went out. She doesn't tell her husband. She calls her husband, verse 22, and she says, send me and one of the young men and the donkey that I might run to the man of God and come back. I need to go on an errand. That's 14 miles away. He's up in Mount Carmel She's way down in Shunem. Shunem is uh, in the foot of Mount Tabor. It's in northern Israel. If you know your Bible map, you know where the tribe of Issachar was. The Shunemites lived with the people of Issachar. So it's about a 14-mile journey. Now, 14 miles on a donkey, those are rough miles. And uh, it takes a while. And the husband's going, I don't understand. He still doesn't know how serious the son was. He doesn't know what happened. She doesn't say anything to him. She doesn't want to be stopped. Why are you going to him today? It's neither new moon or Sabbath. Now, I won't take a detour here, just a little one. You know what that implies? He says, why would you go to him today? It's not the Sabbath. That would mean if it was another day of the week, it would have been normal for them to gather on the Sabbath. So were they still keeping the Sabbath during this time, even in the northern kingdom? It's very important. And you know who says this is a Shunammite, not an Israelite. So for those who wonder, was the Sabbath important still through this time period? They were keeping the Sabbath. She said, it's okay, don't worry. She doesn't explain it. She says, it is well. And you know what that word is, it is well? She says, shalom. Shalom is sort of a universal word. It's like when Karen and I went to Fiji. They said, bula for everything. Bula was hello, bula was greetings, bula was happy, bula was goodbye. It was just all bula vanaka, bula. And... Uh, it's like in, in Hawaiian, they say what? Aloha. aloha. You can say aloha, hello, and aloha, goodbye. And so uh, she says, shalom, peace, it's okay, don't worry. Then she saddled the donkey, and she said to her servant, drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. Now, when she says drive and go forward, the word there is make haste. Now, how many of you have ridden a horse in your life? How many of you have ridden a donkey? Will you agree that the riding a donkey is very different from riding a horse? You can ride a horse, and I don't know what it is about their size or something, but there's a smoother gait of a horse when it's galloping. If you're trotting, it, it shakes you up pretty good. But when a, a horse has got a, a, a gait and they're moving along, you can stay pretty smooth on their back. A donkey's not like that. If you get on a donkey, a donkey sort of, you, you don't see a donkey gallop. Donkeys just run real fast. And you ever seen some of these power runners? Kind of looks weird when you see a power runner. 
You know, if you want a person to run, you just break into a run. There's something smooth about it. But these people that are power walking, well, a donkey sort of power runs. And if you're on the back of a donkey and he's going fast, he's like, <laughs> this really, that's what it's like. And so she says to the servant, do not slacken the pace for me. She's might, he might be thinking, you're getting beaten to death. She says, I don't care. This is urgent. Go fast. Do not slow down unless I tell you. So she departed and she went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And so it was when the man of God saw her afar off. Does God see us afar off when we're coming to him? Did the father see the prodigal son from afar when he's coming? Does the Lord see us if we draw near to him? He sees us when we're drawing near. And so from afar off, he says to Gehazi, look, that's the Shunammite woman. You know why he recognized her far off? Because he used to see her come for Sabbath. That's why the, her husband said, it's not Sabbath. Why are you going to the man of God? So she was a worshiper. Is that clear to everybody? He recognized her when she was coming, recognized her servant, recognized her donkey. And he said, look, the Shunammite woman. Please run now to meet her. So she's drawing near. He runs to meet her. That's the same kind of story that you hear in the, um, the prodigal son. When the prodigal son is coming home, not only does the father see him from afar off, says he runs to meet him. And he runs to meet her. Uh, and um, he says, check with her and ask her, is it well? Is it well with your husband? It's, it's not the Sabbath or new moon. What are you doing here? Is it well with the child? You know what he's asking? He's saying, is it shalom? Is it shalom? And Gehazi gets there. He says, is all well? He's saying, is all shalom? And she answers, it is shalom. Now, why does she not tell Gehazi there's a problem? For one thing, I think she recognized that Gehazi didn't have the faith. You read the story of Gehazi further on, you'll know that too. Next chapter tells you that Gehazi was serving Elisha with ulterior motives. Um, that's in chapter five in the story of Naaman. She thought, you know, Gehazi is not the one I want. I need to go directly to Elisha. I need to get into his presence. She said, it's fine. And when she came into the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet. She lunges for his feet and she clings to his feet. But Gehazi, she, she thought, what's going on? He's like, in, you know, he's not only the apprentice for Elisha, he's sort of the bodyguard. And he's wondering why she's grabbed him by the feet. Now, if you're going to hurt someone, you usually don't go for their feet. This is an act of pleading and worship. And she gets a hold of his feet and she hangs on to him. And Gehazi is going to thrust her away. But he says, let her alone. Her soul is in deep distress. And the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. So she said to the man of God, did I ask a son of my Lord? I didn't pray for a son. And I said, do not deceive me. Now she hasn't said what happened, but right away Elisha knows that there's been something terrible that has happened to the boy. All he has to do is look at the mother's face and realize that she's lost her son. And um, Elisha says, the Lord has hidden this from me. And he says to Gehazi, verse 29, get yourself ready, take my staff in your hand and be on your way to meet, if you meet anyone on the road, do not greet him. If anyone greets you, do not answer him. Now I want you to notice some things that are happening here. I'm rushing along with the story. He invited her request. She prays. She has a miracle birth. This is what Mary does. Um, her son dies in the field. Now who does this miracle son represent? He's a type of Jesus. What is the field? Christ says the sower is sowing the good seed, right? This field is the world. Jesus is out working in the field. And when she gets to Elisha, she grabs him by the feet and she clings and she will not let go. What does Mary do with Jesus? At the resurrection, she lunges for his feet to grab him, to worship him. And he says, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father but sometimes you've got to get a hold of the Lord. What did Jacob do? He said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So when Elisha says to Gehazi, look, I want you to run ahead. Here's what I want you to do. Um, go now 
and um, take my staff in your hand, I'm in verse 20. If you meet anyone along the way, do not greet him. If anyone greets you, do not answer him, but lay my staff on the face of the child. It's urgent, the boy's died. You don't wanna wait too long if you're gonna have a resurrection. That's why it was such a miracle when uh, Lazarus was raised. Most other resurrections that Jesus performed wasn't that long after. Now, isn't it interesting that when Jesus sent out the disciples, he actually says to the disciples when they're preaching, Luke 10, verse three, go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, or sandals. Greet no one along the road. Why did Jesus send the disciples out and say greet no one on the road? Wouldn't you think Christians would be told be friendly to people on the road? What Jesus is saying is as you go from town to town, you've got a mission. Do not get distracted along the way with idle chatter, but be focused on getting to your next mission. And the devil's gonna try to distract you. He's saying to Gehazi, don't linger. When people would pass each other on the road, no, you don't do it in our culture because you drive by and you don't even give a person a look. Every now and then you'll you know, wave to another driver, hopefully you're waving to another driver. But, uh, you know, people are coming and going so fast. Back in a little more rural life, when people passed each other, the polite thing was you'd stop and you'd visit. And then you'd go on your way to the market or on your way back to the ranch. And so Gehazi saying, uh, Elisha says to Gehazi, don't even slow down, but make haste as you go. And Gehazi, Gehazi went ahead of them. But the mother says, in verse 30, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. She said, you might be sending your servant, but I'm, I'm not going anywhere without you. You're the one that promised me this child. I need you to come. And so he told the Gehazi, he says, well, do what I've said. So Gehazi runs off ahead, and she and Elisha follow after. You can see that. She says, I will not leave you, and says, so he arose and followed her. Elisha said, I will go with you. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them. He's running on ahead, he's younger. And he comes to the ranch and he goes upstairs into the room and sure enough, there's the boy on the bed, stone cold, silent. And Gehazi takes the staff and he lays it on the face of the child, pulls it off, nothing happens. Maybe he tries it a second or a third time. There's nothing. Therefore, he goes back and now he meets Elisha and the the Shunammite woman in route. And he says, the child is not awakened. what What word did they use to refer to death? See, even back then, they referred to it as sleep. Now, why didn't Elisha tell him what to do with the staff? Why didn't it work? Did Jesus send out the disciples to cast out devils? Did it work most of the time? Can you think of at least one time it didn't work? They said to the Lord, why couldn't we cast the devil out of that boy? That's in Mark chapter 9. And Jesus said, this kind comes forth by nothing except prayer and fasting. It's a serious case. Now, it doesn't even happen for Elisha right away. And so this becomes a real spiritual battle. And Elisha came into the house where the child was, verse 32, lying dead on his bed. He therefore, he shut the door behind the two of them, the two of them being he and the boy, and he prayed to the Lord. And he went up and he laid on the child. And he probably couldn't do it all at once because he out, you know, he's a lot bigger than this little boy. And it says he put his mouth on his mouth. And in one commentary I read, it said he may have breathed into him trying to inflate his lungs. They used to do that sometimes even if a person drowned back then. He put his eyes on his eyes. He put his hand on his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child. And the flesh of the child became warm. It's not... Isn't it interesting that the Shunammite woman warmed David and years later now you've got the prophet, the Israelite, warming the Shunammite boy. But he's not alive. And he returned and he walked back and forth in the house. He went back downstairs. He's pacing back and forth. What do you think he's doing? He's praying. You know what else I think he's thinking? Elisha remembered where Elijah raised a boy. God promised Elisha would have a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Elijah lived with a widow woman 
who built, who put him in an upper room. And her son died, very similar. And she was not an Israelite, she was a Canaanite. And he had to pray and stretch himself upon the child several times and then there was a resurrection. When the rain came for Elisha, did the answer come right away or did he have to pray and pray? Seven times he prayed. And he went up and he stretched himself on the child again like Elisha, Elijah did and he's praying and he's claiming the promises of God and you can only imagine he's saying, Lord, you inspired me to tell this woman she would have a child. Like Abraham and Sarah had Isaac, a miracle has happened. You've got a plan for this child and now he's been gone. Resurrect him. What's going to happen to your name? They're going to think you failed, Lord. I can just imagine all the things that Elisha was saying to the Lord. But he continues to pray. He intercedes. This answer doesn't come easy. What do you think the mother's doing downstairs? She's praying too. But finally, the child revives and the first thing he does is he sneezes seven times. Now you might see somebody twitch their eyes. You say, did they move? Uh, was there a flinch? But when someone sneezes, you ever tried to hide a sneeze? <laughs> a sneeze is something that's full of life. It's, it's something that is very aggressive. It's very animated. And when someone sneezes seven times, it means, wow, I guess they're really alive. And it's, it's another thing that's happening is when you sneeze, you breathe deeply and you kind of clear yourself out. Okay? Well, you don't even know what the problem was that caused this death. But seven's another number. It symbolizes that he is very alive. He's expelling... Jesus cast seven devils out of Mary Magdalene. You know why they say tight when you sneeze? Because there was a belief that you had some germ or something in you and your sneezing clears it out. And there's an element of truth to that. The sneezing is supposed to expel things that are not healthy for your sinuses, whether it be pollen or germs or whatever. So his sneezing seven times is a sign of the evil being sent out and he's healed, he's cleansed, and he opens his eyes, and he called Gehazi, and he says to him, go call this Shunammite woman. So he called her, and she came into him. He said, pick up your son. Last time you set him on my bed, he was dead. Now he's alive. Receive your son. And she went in, and what does she do? Before she picks up her son, she falls at his feet again and bows to the ground, and then she picked up her son. She worships him. She picks up her son and she went out. Now that's the story. This is a wonderful story that helps illustrate the, the promises of God in the Bible. Do you know that's not the last time the Shunammite appears in the Bible account. A few years later, Elisha the prophet comes to the Shunammite woman and you read in 2 Kings 8, you have to jump ahead a few chapters. This is the same one. You know what's amazing about this woman? What's her name? It's never given. Just calls her the Shunammite woman. People were often named by their places. It's like Jesus was called Jesus of Nazareth. And this is this wealthy woman of Shunam. Don't you wish you knew what her name was? I think one reason her name's not getting is because she represents something. I'll get to that in just a minute. Elisha speaks, 2 Kings 8 verse 1, Elisha speaks to the woman whose son he had restored to life saying, Arise and go, you and your household, and stay wherever you can, for the Lord has called for a famine. Furthermore, it will come upon the land for seven years. Was there another seven-year famine in the days of Joseph? Was there a famine in the days of Ruth? And... Naomi and her household went to live somewhere else because there was a famine. And so he's preparing her in advance. Go live where you can, but there's going to be a famine in northern Israel. And you wonder if, you know, that was one of the famines that came because of the idolatry that is spoken of. So the woman arose. Was there a drought during the time of Elijah? How long was the drought during the time of Elijah? Three and a half. How long is the famine during the time of Elisha? Seven, which is two times three and a half. Interesting, huh? Elisha gets a double portion. Elisha gets twice as much famine. 
as Elijah had. So the woman arose and did according to the saying of the man of God. And she went with her household and dwelt in the land of the Philistines. That was down lower regions. They were able to water by hand down there for seven years. And it came to pass at the end of seven years, the woman returned to the land from the land of the Philistines and she went to make an appeal to the king for her house and her land. Why is she doing this? Because while she was gone, the other neighbors moved in and they took over. They said, oh, she's left. And she's just a Canaanite. She's not one of us. And they moved in. They took over her ranch. They took over her land, even though it was hers and it had been for generations. She gets back home and they've occupied her place and said, look, finders keepers. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. You were gone. You were gone for years. We stuck through the famine. You're not getting your land back. The only one that can help her now is the king. Remember once Elisha said to her, can I speak to the king for you? So it just so happens that on the very day that the king is sitting as Supreme Court, they, there were judges in the land of Israel that would take care of the minor cases, but the major cases were brought to the king directly. And the different cases would come in. And while the king and the court and the scribes are writing things out, and they're saying, next case, and then they'd have a break, and next case, and in the breaks between the cases, Gehazi is visiting with the king of Israel and the king is saying tell me you saw Elisha firsthand. tell me some of the miracles that you've seen working with Elisha and you can read here it says the king talked with Gehazi the servant of the man of God saying tell me please all the great things that Elisha has done and it happened he gets to the greatest thing he was telling the king how he restored the dead to life and there was the woman right when he's telling him about this resurrection I saw it with my, the boy was dead I laid the staff on his face and he didn't come back to life and then the, the clerk says your majesty next case he says okay bring it bring it in who is it well, this is this woman now she's a Canaanite woman a Shunammite oh what does she want and Gehazi says to the king your majesty that's the woman and that's the boy that was dead and that was brought back to life again that's all the king needed to hear. Isn't God's providence interesting? And he says, this is the, this is the one right here. This is the, the, the woman whose son was restored. And there she was appealing to the king for her house and her land. And Gehazi says, this is her and this is her son that Elisha restored to life. And they said, he brings me, he says, tell me what happened. She threw Gehazi translating. Says, it's true, he was completely dead and Elisha brought him back to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him, so the king appointed a certain officer and he said, you follow this woman, take some soldiers with you, you go back to her territory and you tell her neighbors, thus says the king, everything that was hers that she lost will be restored. And not only did she get all her land back, the king went even further and he said, and any income from the produce on that land during the seven years she was gone, they'll restore that too. So she didn't lose anything by being gone. Now this woman had a son that was given. Why? She made a place in her home for God. Because she invited the Lord, in inviting Elisha, Jesus said, when people do it to you, they do it to me. Here's the point of everything I've said. So if you missed everything else, just catch this. In inviting Elisha into her home, she was inviting the Lord into their lives. In doing that, she received great blessings. What she and her husband wanted more than anything was a son. She got a son of promise, a miracle son. What does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? Christ needs to be in our home, in our church, first and foremost, and also in your homes. So, she invites him in, has a miracle boy, but then there's a trial that comes. The boy is taken away. She goes back to the man of God, prays again, he is restored, and he continues to grow up. Her land, through the man of God, because she has this relationship, Elisha doesn't tell his own people there's going to be a famine, you need to run for cover. But he tells this woman. Why does he tell this woman? because they have a relationship. She represents the church. Does God give us prophecy in his word? Does the Lord speak to us in a way he doesn't speak to everyone else? Do we know something about what's coming other people don't know? Why? Because we've opened our door and we said, Lord, this is your house. We want you in our house. Will he do that for you personally? 
and she loses everything during this famine, but she goes back to the man of God and she prays and it's all restored again. Because of her relationship with Elisha, the king gives everything back with the proceeds. This is a story of great uh, restoration. It has to do with our inviting God into our lives. What that woman did with Elisha, the Lord wants us to do with Jesus. Now, one more thing I want to share with you. There are seven examples in the Bible. It's interesting, seven years of famine, seven sneezes. There are seven miracle babies in the Bible. You may have heard me say this before, but this is one of the stories, so it bears repeating, especially during this time of year. Seven women in the Bible were barren that had babies. They all have baby boys, which is unusual, that are all types of Christ. Sarah has who? Isaac. Isaac. Is Isaac a type of Christ? Goes up to the place of sacrifice with the wood on his back. He's a willing sacrifice like Jesus. Isaac's a type of Christ. Rebecca is barren. Isaac prays for her. She has twins. Their names? Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the one who receives the spiritual blessing. He's a type of Christ. He's the father of the patriarchs. He has 12 patriarchs. Jesus has 12 um, disciples. He's a shepherd and there's many ways that Jacob is a parallel of Christ. He intercedes. He wrestles with God. Rachel is barren. She gets a hold of Jacob and says, give me children ere I die. He says, am I the Lord? She was having problems. But through prayer, she has a son. What's his name? Firstborn. Joseph, her firstborn, Joseph. Is Joseph a type of Christ? Sold by his own brothers for silver? But he forgives them, feeds the whole world? I mean, wonderful analogies of Joseph and Jesus. The robe of Joseph is covered with blood and presented to the Father. There's a woman, we don't know her name. It's Manoah's wife, we know his name. She's barren, has a miracle son. What's his name? Samson. Samson. Is he a type of Christ? I know he did a lot of things wrong, but he kills the lion like David. And um, he sacrifices his life at the end. Samson was blinded as Jesus was blinded. He was bound as Jesus was bound. He was imprisoned as Jesus was imprisoned. And then he stretches out his arms. He is filled with the Spirit, and he defeats God's enemies through his death. This is what Jesus did. So Samson is a type of Christ. Do you see that? Hannah has a son named Samuel. Is Samuel a type of Christ? He's a prophet. He's a priest. He's a judge in Israel. Lives a godly life. You won't find a record of Samuel failing. The only thing Samuel ever does wrong is he thinks that Eliab is supposed to be the king and God says, don't look on the outside. It's not him. It's the youngest. It's David. But everything else, Samuel is always faithful. He listens to God. And then you know who you have next? The Shunammite woman. Her son that we just read about dies in the field working with his father in a harvest. Didn't Jesus say that he's come to help with the harvest? And then finally you have in the New Testament another old father and a mother that are childless that have a miracle boy. What's his name? John the Baptist who is the forerunner of Jesus. These are all types of Christ. And in each case talks about them inviting God into their homes. And that's what this story is about. This woman made a place for God in the home to stay as a guest and then he blesses with the greatest blessings. All is restored. There's a resurrection that takes place. The power of God is seen. And uh, this is really a story about Jesus. Do you see that? I, I see this. This is a wonderful, wonderful story in the Bible. Now the question is, is our church open to Christ? You know, when this woman who is a type of the church, this Shunammite woman, um, she became a witness to all of her neighbors. Christ was born in her home or this baby miracle birth takes place in her home and then there's a resurrection that takes place. Jericho, Jesus was born twice miraculously. His first birth was a miracle. His resurrection, his second birth is a miracle. This child has both those births. All of this has to happen because she invites them into her home. Uh, are we inviting Christ into our church? He will do things for us and bless us in ways unlike others because we have that relationship. And are we inviting them into our homes? I think we all know about common hospitality. This goes beyond that. 
having an ongoing relationship where you're in communication with Jesus every day. Do you want that relationship? I do too.